In 1945, a famed mathematician, Girolamo Cardano, published Ars Magna, the great art, wherein he spoke of a concept that earned it its consideration as one of the three greatest scientific treatises of the early Renaissance, together with Copernicus's De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium and Vesalius's De Humani Corporis Fabrica, the first recorded acknowledgement of the existence of imaginary numbers in relation to general formulas for cubic and quartic equations. Fast forward to 1739, when Daniel Bernoulli published the book Hydrodynamica, wherein he describes, mathematically, fluid dynamics. To do this, he sees that imaginary numbers are indeed very convenient and make his ideas much easier to convey, and so he incorporates them. Now to 1926, when Erwin Schrödinger published his Schrödinger equation, which predicts certain quantum events in quantum systems through probabilities, for example, the position and momentum of particles. This equation is made up of the wave function, which is complex valued, and as it turns out, the Schrödinger equation becomes incredibly useful for predicting real world events. It's not an unusual occurrence in the history of mathematics and the natural sciences, where discovering one prompts a reformulation of the other. Take Newton and Leibniz's discovery of calculus. It was the main driving factor behind the development of celestial mechanics, which is the movement of celestial bodies. The study of thermodynamics, as well, led to new tools when analyzing the behavior of complex systems, such as with chaos theory. The study of group theory, a branch of abstract algebra, has been instrumental in understanding the symmetry of physical systems, such as crystalline structures and subatomic particles and the development of non-Euclidean geometry, which explores the properties of curved spaces, helped Albert Einstein develop his theory of general relativity, which describes the behavior of gravity. And these are just a few examples. It's strange, or maybe it's expected, how well mathematics describes the real world. This fact that the physical world reveals such extreme mathematical regularity prompted Galileo Galilei to reclaim that nature was a book written in language of mathematics, and Nobel laureate Eugene Wigner to stress the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences. To some it's weird that the resemblance is more or less flawless, after all, our mathematics with our notation, our monkey understandings, is more or less invented by us. Why then, they may ask, is it so that the universe abides our made-up laws and theorems? To others, it's completely understandable why, in fact, it would be strange if maths and physics weren't alike. We live in the universe and observe the universe, and are a granted small part of the universe. So why shouldn't we come up with a system that mimicked what we saw in nature? Roger Penrose, the Nobel laureate British mathematician and physicist, highlights this relationship. Uh, take the chair you're sitting on, it's solid stuff, you know it's really real. What's our best scientific understanding of what it's made up of? You say, well, it's made out of fibers that are strung together, which are made out of cells, and so on. Those cells are made up of molecules, and those molecules are made out of atoms, which are nuclei and electron orbitals or clouds. You may then ask, what's the nucleus made out of? Well, protons and neutrons, which are held together by gluons, quarks, and so on. At this stage, if you ask, well, what are quarks and electrons? And the best you can do is describe some mathematical structure, say things that satisfy the Dirac equations. It appears that whenever we follow the path of questioning, we arrive at mathematics and equations that are fantastically accurate. In fact, mathematics can describe both the big and the small, the macroscopic and the microscopic. Newton's equations of gravity, for example, were accurate to 1 in 10 to the 7, that is 1 in 10 million. This is absurdly precise considering that Newton maybe had three or four significant figures of observation to deal with, and that much of what he figured out came directly out of his head, from theory. The same is true for Einstein's theories of gravity, with curved spacetime and such. His equations work with a precision of 1 in 10 to the 14, that is twice the number of sig figs that Newton's agreed with. What is remarkable about this mathematics is that actually it's very easy to write down, that is, it isn't very complex. Granted, but with curved spacetime and such, it is hard to get your head around, although that isn't very strange when considering our monkey brains designed for avoiding predators and to reproduce. The mathematical truths that we prove to be true will always be and have always been true. There's an argument to be made that we discovered mathematics, and as we search deeper and deeper into the nature of reality, instead of having invented it, 
and fitted it into our observations of the microscopic and macroscopic. One of the greatest physicists of the 20th century, Richard Feynman, draws a line between mathematicians and physicists, yet suggests that one requires the other. The mathematician, he says, always tries to generalize, say with n-dimensional space, whereas the physicist is always concerned with the specific case that care about n equals 3, because that's where we live. And as it turns out, things always seem to reduce and simplify themselves for the physicist, because they care about something specific, something that's right there in front of them. He believed that either profession could benefit from learning the other, that physicists need to learn how to speak in abstract maths, and that mathematicians need to learn the practicality of physics. If you state the axioms, you say such and such a so, and such and such a so, and such and such a so, what then? Then the logic can be carried out without knowing what the such and such words mean. That is, if, if the statements about the axioms are true, are, I mean, are carefully formulated and complete enough, it is not necessary for the man who's doing the reasoning to have any knowledge of the meaning of these words. When you know what it is you're talking about, that these things are forces, and these are masses, and this is inertia, and this is so on, then you can use an awful lot of common sense, seat of the pants feeling about the world. You've seen various things. You know more or less how the phenomenon is going to behave. As it turns out, the common senseness of the physicist tends to approach them according to Feynman meaningless mathematical structures and equations. The nomenclature that Feynman discusses that this is inertia, that's gravity, and so on, tends to the extremely abstract and equations seemingly unpinned to any physical idea. In early 2014, Max Tegmark, a Swedish mathematician and physicist, wrote the book Our Mathematical Universe my quest for the ultimate nature of reality, in which he argues that the universe can not only be described entirely in mathematical equations, but that our reality is ultimately a mathematical construct. This bold claim challenges our intuition about the relationship between maths and the physical world, and raises questions about the nature of reality itself. According to Tegmark, there are four distinct levels of multiverses that describe the true nature of reality each of which is based on a different set of mathematical principles. The first level, known as the level 1 multiverse, is based on the idea of cosmic inflation. According to this theory, the universe underwent a period of exponential expansion just after the Big Bang, resulting in a vast, flat expanse of space-time. In fact, the predicted universe is infinite. Tegmark argues that since the universe is infinite, there must exist an infinite number of what's called Hubble volumes, which are basically the spherical expanse an observer can know anything about, like our observable universe. Each of these Hubble volumes will realize, in total, all initial conditions, and therefore all possible parallel universes. The level 2 multiverse, similarly, is based on the concept of infinitely inflating space. Here, instead of the space in the single level 1 multiverse expanding, the space in between each is expanding, where each multiverse is like a bubble, forever separate from the others. It's possible that if the mathematical equations governing uniform space have multiple solutions, then, while many physical laws and constants are unchanged across the level 1 multiverse, they may vary across the level 2 multiverse. Tegmark gives an analogy. Students in the same level 1 parallel universe learn the same thing in physics class, but different things in history, whereas students in level 2 parallel universes could learn different things in physics classes as well. The level 3 multiverse is based on the concept of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. According to this theory, every quantum event results in the creation of multiple parallel universes, each of which corresponds to a different possible outcome. This multiverse is similar to the first, where the only thing that differs is where your doppelganger resides, one 10 to the 10 to the 150 meters away in good old 3D space, and the other, they live in another quantum branch in an infinitely dimensional Hilbert space. Finally, the level 4 multiverse is based on the idea that all possible mathematical structures not only exist, but are also physically realized. This means that every mathematical universe is the physical universe, and that there are an infinite number of universes corresponding to every possible mathematical structure. Tegmark calls this the ultimate ensemble, and is his own mathematical universe hypothesis. 
If the idea of nested multiverses and living in a mathematical structure is confusing, imagine a game with objects or substructures which interact and relate according to some clearly defined set of rules. A perfect illustration of this is chess. Imagine the game of chess, with all of its pieces and rules and board and such, as part of the level 4 multiverse. Like our universe, it has one temporal dimension but only two spatial ones, wherein all the pawns and pieces can move. Now imagine the board with all of its pieces set up to begin, that is before move number 1. During move number 1, white has 20 possible moves and then black has 20, so there are a total of 400 possible positions after the first move. Think of the level 3 multiverse as all the possible moves in a certain position, branching out to an unimaginable but computable number of games and positions. Then going deeper, think of the level 2 multiverse as containing all the different variants of chess, like Fisher Random, Horde, 4 Player, and Atomic. Each of these have different rules or boards, which should be thought of as the varying physical constants and forces in our level 2 multiverse. Chess's level 1 multiverse is again one containing all possible games, each their own little universe. Remember how the level 1 and 3 multiverse could technically be seen as one, as each constitutes all the different possibilities of a certain variant of chess. The MUH or Mathematical Universe Hypothesis suggests that our external physical reality is a mathematical structure. In other words, the physical universe is not merely described by mathematics, but it is mathematics. This is one of the most controversial ideas in physics and speculations about a possible theory of everything, but it, as a theory, is to an extent supported by infinite inflation, and does explain some of the most complex scientific conundrums, like the measure problem, and it satisfies one of, if not the biggest query. What is the true nature of the universe? Tegmark also considers augmenting the MUH with a second assumption, the computable universe hypothesis, CUH, which suggests that the mathematical structure that is our external physical reality is defined entirely by computable functions. The idea that the universe is ultimately computable leads, naturally, to questions about whether we live in a simulation, whether our external reality and our internal one is just computed by an incredibly powerful machine. This touches on another very complex idea, that of consciousness. Emergence as a concept is when the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. When observing the universe, we see how fundamental emergence really is. Take your body, for example. All you are are a bunch of dumb organs that work smartly together. Now, what are your organs made up of? Well, loosely, cells, which work dumbly unless together with thousands, millions of their colleagues. These work individually due to the randomness of the movement of their organelles, which are really big molecules made up of hundreds of billions of atoms. Rewind and you see how the dumb randomness of microscopic particles makes up an intelligent entity like yourself. Part of what prompted the mathematical universe hypothesis is this, the external reality hypothesis, that there exists an external physical reality completely independent of humans. We humans with our human baggage that we require to explain the universe are just emergent properties of reality. If you look at the spectrum from human-centered subjects to purely natural subjects, consider this pattern. We start at societies and cultures, which are studied by sociology, then our minds, which are studied by psychology, then neural dynamics and the brain by neuroscience, our cells and their structure by biology, then molecules by chemistry, and atoms and quantum fields by physics. Each of the former seems to be predicted as an emergent property of the latter. So next down the chain is some theory of everything. The higher up the emergence or the human ladder we go, the more explanation or human baggage is needed. And as we approach the theory of everything, it seems we need less words and need to use more rigorous equations in the logic of mathematics. Isn't it reasonable then to think that the further down we go, the more we will explain the basis of reality with mathematics? Shaped, or rather influenced by the idea or the belief that the universe is fundamentally mathematical in nature, Tegmark suggests that consciousness is, like life itself, an emergent property. That is, it comes out naturally from the relations, connections, and interactions within complex systems, rather than being a fundamental aspect of the universe. Coming from the perspective of a physicist, it seems therefore natural to try to extrapolate and say that yes, consciousness can be modeled using mathematical equations. Instead of asking, why is it that this complex set of fundamental particles has a subjective experience, you can transform this into a fact 
that some particles have it and others don't. He concludes that there should then be some physical principle or equation which tells you what is conscious and what isn't. Max Tegmark's mathematical universe hypothesis also seems to answer one of the most daunting problems in cosmology, the measure problem. The measure problem has been described by experts as one of the greatest crises in science. It pops up whenever we try to calculate relative probabilities in an infinite number of observer moments, which refers to infinitesimally small snippets of a single subjective experience. And an example is as follows. What is the fraction of all the counting numbers, 1, 2, 3, and so on, which are even? There are infinitely many numbers, infinitely many of which are even, so we're stuck with infinity or infinity, which isn't very helpful. Mathematicians, however, figure out that we could take the first n whole numbers and count how many are even. If we keep on increasing n, and take the limit where n approaches infinity, we get the nice fraction 1 over 2, 1 half. That's nice enough, but our answer depended on how we order the numbers. Say we take the numbers in the order 1, 2, 4, 3, 6, 8, 5, 10, 12, 7, 14, 16, and so on. Now the limit gives us 2 thirds as the fraction of evens out of all the whole numbers, which seems absurd. Similarly, imagine you're sitting in a room and suddenly a fully formed human brain appears out of thin air. Not just any brain, but one that's capable of thinking and experiencing the world around it. This brain has all the memories and knowledge of a person, but it hasn't come from a human body. It's just floating there in front of you. This is what's known as a Boltzmann brain. The Boltzmann brain is based on the idea that in an infinite and random universe, anything that's possible will eventually happen. This includes the formation of random objects, like fully formed brains. According to the laws of thermodynamics, there's a small but non-zero chance that a highly organized system could spontaneously form out of chaos. This means that it's theoretically possible for a fully formed brain to just appear out of nowhere. It's extremely unlikely, but not impossible. The problem with Boltzmann brains is that they create a paradox for our understanding of the universe. If these brains can appear out of nowhere, and if they should be infinitely more common than the continuum of subjective experiences of a brain from intelligent civilization, then how do we know that our own brains aren't just random fleeting objects that will disappear as quickly as they appeared? Tiegmark attempts to solve this problem by saying that if the level 4 multiverse exists and reality is inherently mathematical, then it should be possible to order mathematical structures based on simplicity, such as 2 to the negative n, where n is the number of bits required to describe or store all the information of a structure. He argues this is the most reasonable order, seeing as the laws of nature tend to simplicity. This finally means that we should expect to find ourselves in the simplest mathematical structures. This argument is basically a mathematical version of Occam's razor. Well, so what? What now? Say our reality was fundamentally, ultimately, inarguably mathematical in nature. It may or may not be, and we may never know. There's really only one prediction made by this hypothesis, which is that we should be able to find a single equation that predicts and perfectly describes our reality, with no exceptions nor with what Tegmar called human baggage. This is what, arguably, pushes it over the edge from pseudoscience to a serious scientific theory. But what is more about the particular significance of mathematics and physics is how it gives meaning to, or perhaps is giving meaning by, the beauty of mathematics. It's not only influential for mathematicians who historically, perhaps excessively, bask in the uselessness or impracticality of pure mathematics, but also for the non-mathematicians. It tells us to appreciate the abstractness, purity, simplicity, orderliness, and elegance of mathematics. Tegmach's ultimate ensemble of mathematical universe is a review of what philosophers, those who purportedly love wisdom and strive for truth, knew or had figured out two and a half millennia ago. Platonism, for example, argues that certain abstract ideas have a real independent existence beyond our minds. I suppose that's what's been hailed as the sole field of objective truth should stand alone in governing reality. The MUH gives us a sort of scientific argument for a type of nihilism, but if we and the universe and reality is mathematics and mathematics in and of itself is beautiful, and if we are the universe experiencing itself, then we get to experience firsthand the beauty of reality, of physics and mathematics. And as always, thanks for watching and tune in for next time.